I'd like to call to order this meeting of the uh, Southern New York County School District Finance and Budget Committee. Uh, could we all rise and pledge allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, could we have roll call, please? Bruce Bauman. Here. Elizabeth Dalberman. Here. Mary Lee Hall. Here. Samantha Hall. Here. James Holly. Here. Kelly Jarvis. Here. Robert Schefter. Here. Danielle Weaver Watts. Here. R. Michael Wofford. Here. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have, it doesn't look like we have anyone for public comment. Not this evening. All, all right, then we'll move along to the uh, meeting agenda items and this meeting tonight is to hear a detailed presentation of the proposed 2023-2024 budget and also some other financial items so on that note i'm going to turn it over to mrs green and mr carrington thank you very much good evening everyone we're going to walk through um, the budget presentation this evening So this evening we are going to um, walk through um, the objectives and the process for the budget. So the board approved a resolution to stay at or below the PD index of 5.1% at the December meeting. Um, so we're going to talk about where we are in that process. We'll discuss the major challenges or budget drivers um, for this year's budget. Uh, we'll talk about the work with the administrative team in preparing the budget. Um, we'll look at our biggest priority, which are student needs and the review of enrollment as we put the budget together. Um, and then we will ask to, um, for any questions and for the board to look at this proposed budget as we will be looking for approval of the proposed budget at the April meeting and the um, final budget at the May meeting. Um, so we started a couple years ago um, putting this on the first slide because this is what people are looking um, towards the end, but it will work through <coughs> why we got to this point, but this budget is balanced with a proposed tax increase of 2.46%. So we'll talk about um, uh, how we got there and, and why that is. So back in November, we presented the summary of the budget, uh, and at that point in time, um, we had a deficit of $3.2 million. Remember, it was a very conservative budget at that, at that point. Um, but that deficit did not include any new or requested items. It did include a $400,000 contingency at that point in time. Um, we've now reduced that to $300,000, which is what we normally have in the budget. Did use fund balance of $1.5 million um, and would take the full um, Act 1 maximum of about 5.1%. Um, so at that point, um, what we were looking for was the ability to make sure that we could stay within that index, and we could, and, and we've made a lot of changes since November. So as we're working through the budget, the one thing we're looking at, um, how are we doing this year? So we are doing well this year. Um, so our revenue, uh, we're within, we believe our projections are within um, a half a percent of uh, what the budget was, and we believe that to be a good number. I'm not sure it's going to stay at a half percent, but I will say that last year for 21-22, um, we finished um, with a difference between projections of $1,794, so um, very close. Don't think we're going to get it that close again ever, but I will say this. Revenue is the easier of the two pieces. Um, we generally get pretty close to that, um, and we believe it to be a really good estimate. What is more difficult? is the expenditure side. Um, so we continue to um, have a surplus in salaries and benefits. And this is a reminder that um, for every salary dollar, we have it up between 40 to 45% of benefits. So whenever we don't have a salary um, filled for any portion of time or a position filled for any portion of time, um, we have the salary dollar and then another almost half of that again in the benefit mm -hmm. side. So um, that's really what's driving um, that, that higher number at this point, and we're continuing to work through that. The only other area um, that is um, uh, below projection quite a bit are purchase professional and technical services. So we'll talk about a little bit about that as we go um, through the budget, but that's really our, our student placement area, so we have removed some of that from the budget. 
And that's really, and as we talk through it, that's as a result of some of the changes we've made in the last couple of years in bringing back programs. So where we are now, we're going to start, and we'll, we'll look at this again at the end of the presentation, but we're going to start with the March summary. We now are at a deficit of $2.5 million, um, use of fund balance of $1.5 million, and then that, then that other $185,000 um, assigned for security projects, that's a result of last month when the security projects were approved. Remember we had grant funding mm -hmm. and then we needed to use assigned fund balance for the rest of that. That's that $185,000. And then it shows you that's where the tax increase of 2.46% is the $822,000 that's generated from that. So we'll kind of walk through um, how we got there. All right. So I will take over from here. Um, what I'm, the first slide that you see right now, it's a lot of our major, major cost drivers of the budget. Um, there are obviously are a lot more, but this is what makes up about $1.6 million of the change in the budget. Um, and the next several slides will go through these in detail. So really just to summarize, it's health insurance was a big cost increase. Charter school costs, as we've talked a lot about, was about 241000 um, utilities, just lumping them all together, was about 258000 We'll talk more about that. Transportation was $120,000. Um, insurance, so not medical stuff, um, but the liability, so to protect ourselves in the building we're in, was another $63,000 increase. And then debt service, um, that will be covered by Sue later in the presentation. All right, so um, this slide, if you've watched along or been with our finance and budget presentations over the last several years. You've seen this slide before. Um, <clears throat> really what this is showing is just that our, our kind of plan cost versus our funding rate. Um, so within the 2023-24 budget, we have budgeted a 15% health insurance increase. Um, and what that <laughs> is really doing, if you see the chart, and I know probably on the printed version it's hard to see, but the, the top line is our plan cost, so that is what our claims are driving. And the, the line below that is what we are paying for those claims. So the reason why they don't match is because we are self-insured. So for all of those years prior, when the dark blue line was on top and the light blue line was on the bottom, we were saving that money in, our, um, in the Lincoln Benefit Trust. And then when we flipped it, um, we were paying, like we had higher claims for what we were actually paying for. So ultimately the goal is to get them as close as possible. They're never really going to <clears throat> hit at the same exact time just because that's an actuarial assumption of our plan, of the funding rate um, versus the actual plan cost. So ideally it's to get them close together. But over time, if you look at the difference between the two lines, we have had a very low average in health insurance increases. It's just we're getting it all in one year. And that's really, that's that self-insured piece. When you get a lot of claims hitting at the same time, that, that's what can happen. So um, the next slide is charter school costs. So as I mentioned before on that first slide, charter school costs are driving about $241,000 of our budget increase this year. Um, what this slide shows is just um, our costs compared to York County, the intermediate unit, and then the state. Um, so you can see $344 in that far right column. Um, what that represents is the amount of expenditures going out the door to charter schools for each student we have enrolled here. So not charter school costs, but really we have a round number 3,000 students. Um, $344 per student goes to charter school expenses. So what this really does is mirror us against uh, the rest of the state and our, our peers in the county. So well, yes, it is a big expense and a big increase in our budget compared to our neighbors. We've fared very well. Um, during a rating call earlier this week, we met with Moody's and they actually shared that we have one of the lower charter school costs in the state and he talks to a lot more districts than we do. So we've done an amazing job really working with our charter school expenditures. Um, I know Dr. Reppert and the education side of the organization, they really do talk to every family, just let them know, like, we do have offerings here if it's something that they're interested in, not just a, the expense side of things. Obviously, it's less expensive if they're here, but we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to have whatever learning environment they're looking for. 
So um, next up would be utilities and insurance. So um, probably everybody here may have seen over the past year some increases in bills at home with respect to electricity, natural gas, um, fuel at the gas pump. And then if you get your homeowner's insurance or auto insurance, that bill probably went up too. Um, so like the rest of the world, we have those things and we have to pay for those things. So really a lot of what this is showing um, electricity that we've been, if you look budget years in the past, we've been pretty stable with our electricity costs. Recently, those costs have really gone up a lot. Um, we do hedge and work with other um, districts in our intermediate unit and in um, Lancaster County as well to get the best pricing. It's just the pricing has gone up drastically. Um, and a lot of that is market instability. Same with natural gas. Um, it's a 36% increase. So a lot of these numbers are just very high increases. Um, diesel fuel, as we all know, diesel fuel prices have gone up drastically, or fuel prices have gone up drastically. While we do hedge our diesel fuel, um, that price has just shot up. Uh, we were very, very fortunate a few years ago to hedge at a very low rate during the beginning of the pandemic, and the prices have just rapidly increased. Um, Lastly, with liability and auto insurance, so as I mentioned, liability insurance would be the cost to insure the place we're sitting right now, so the district, um, and all of the related insurances. That has just continued to creep up over the last several years. Um, and again, if you see at home, your liability and homeowner's insurance may have gone up as well. Um, and a lot of that just relates to replacement costs. Um, everything kind of goes up. So one thing to explain with this is uh, a lot of people at home have seen some of these um, costs increasing at the end of last year and throughout this year. We've not felt it as much this year because as Trevor said, we hedge ahead of time. So we have the prices locked in and we locked them in when things were lower. Um, we are out of, out of hedge. We're, we don't have the things hedged for next year at this point. We weren't able to do that because of the market instability and the prices were so high. We're starting to be able to do it now, but at a higher rate than what we would have before. So things that have maybe hit um, you at home or other businesses sooner than this have not really impacted us in this area until this budget that we're doing for next year. So next up is transportation. It's a very important part of our um, of our district and that we have to find a way to get all of our students here. Um, this is under contract with first student and in that contract we have a, about a 5% increase each year. So the while this cost is going up, it is a, um, containing our IU transportation costs because we're transporting more students through our, our normal first student contract. Um, first student along with many other businesses and um, employers they continue to work through their staffing shortages um, with bus drivers and really finding that right wage to pay their employees. So we have talked before about the composition of our budget. So the composition of the 23-24 proposed budget, um, we have about 67% um, salaries and benefits. If you add in our debt service, our transportation and utilities, that takes, up, takes us to about 82% of the budget. So those couple categories um, make up most of our budget. And so what we're going to talk about next is looking at enrollment compared to staffing and making sure um, we are where we need to be. And so that's kind of one of the big steps that we go through as we're putting the budget together. So if we look at enrollment, this is school buildings only. So we, we talk about we have about 3,000 students. These are the students that sit in our chairs each day. So this is a little less. These do not include any placements. They don't include any kiddos that are at York School of Technology. Um, they do not include any charter school students. These are the students that are in our particular buildings. And so um, we compare and look at this each year. If you look at the elementary, um, we compare the three elementaries and the total elementary, and then we look at secondary. And so this goes through um, you know, the last couple years with a projection for 23-24. Um, and basically what we do is we um, roll the students forward. So sixth graders go up to seventh grade, um, eighth graders go up to ninth grade, and then for kindergarten, um, we estimate the number of students based upon the last couple year at 20 children to um, 
a class, but we estimate more kindergartners than what we normally have just to make sure that we have capacity. So as we look at um, some of the other things that we're going to talk about this evening, I just wanted to kind of do the basis for that. So as we go through, we look at class size and student needs. So each year we review this. Um, we look at classroom teachers and class sizes. We look at instructional specialists. We look at spe special education staff and supports that are in our buildings. And we also look at other supports in our classrooms. So we'll start with special education needs. Um, we review um, each of the classroom by caseloads. Um, so for special education, um, there is a caseload maximum. Um, for each of the different um, specialty areas. Um, so we look at that and we also look at um, other areas of support. And as we talked about for the last couple of years, we also look at is there, are there any areas where we can bring students back and house the classrooms here. Um, and then we also, as we're looking at our classrooms, we look at what's the capacity if we have additional students. So I'll give you a, an example there. Um, we have two autistic support classrooms at the elementary level. We believe at this point in time that that um, is adequate and our class sizes are, are, are low enough. Um, but it is something we have on our horizon that in the future we may look to have a third classroom at that um, level. But it just depends on how many students that we have needs. And again, not all the students um, will um, be successful in our classrooms here. So that's what we're looking at, um, success of the students in our classrooms here and also whether we have capacity. Um, so we're not ready to add that third classroom. It's something we're starting to talk about. Um, we have that in our, in our sites to, to kind of look at as we go forward. Um, so the things we are recommending as we look through that and work with um, Dr. Rogers, um, we are recommending an increase um, from a part-time speech pathologist position to a full-time. So we currently have um, 3.4 positions. Um, we are recommending that we increase that to four positions. Um, we're recommending a, a move from a position at an elementary level to middle school for student needs. Um, so we have two life skills classrooms at Friendship Elementary um, due to student needs and number of students. We believe we only need one next year, but we need an additional position at the um, middle school. We're also looking at a reduction of several pair possession professional positions throughout the district. Um, so full-time at the high school, part-time at the middle school, and a part-time at the elementary school. Um, and then finally, we have a high school position that we are not recommending that we fill at this time, but we continue um, to have it in the budget in case student needs would be necessary to fill that. So we do that sometimes also, and you'll hear some of that this evening, um, where we look at student needs. At this point in time, we don't believe we need the professional, but we want to keep it in the budget because um, we could have students that move in. We could have students that um, all of a sudden have needs that they need to be in that particular classroom and so um, that allows us some flexibility at that point in time. So just to go back to the one for the reduction so what you're saying is that we're gonna reduce one full-time high school a part-time middle school so like two total positions and then a part-time elementary so yeah so a full-time the high school a part-time at the middle school and a part-time at the elementary school and those are paraprofessionals in that category yes. Mm -hmm. The other thing to point out there is that they're currently not filled. So when we speak, okay. So we want to speak to the, the, the point of the positions will not be filled versus we're cutting mm -hmm. them or people are being furloughed and mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you, because I wasn't even, yeah, that wasn't even on my, yes, we are not, re in any of these situations, we are not recommending that any existing staff would not have a position. This, a lot, this will be due to attrition, or, or a vacancy in a particular position. Thank you, Dr. Bob, because I wasn't even <clears throat> thinking that way. And that's been, that has been um, the other thing as we look through this is making sure that, again, our existing, we keep our existing staff. That's always been a priority. So then we, we look at elementary enrollment. Um, and class size. So each year we review um, elementary enrollment, and we've been doing that since I've been here. Um, per policy, our average class size at an elementary building cannot exceed 25 students, but that does not mean a particular classroom cannot exceed 25 students. That means is an average in the building cannot exceed 25 students. Um, so priority is given for smaller class size at kindergarten, first, and second grade. So as we're looking at it, um, we want to have those classrooms have smaller class sizes. 
Now, the one thing to point out here is we talk about the difference between a school district and a business. We are a school district, not a business. Um, and so, you know, I try to point that out in the budget presentation. Um, <coughs> we do not get the same number of kids in the same grades at the same building every year. It's not, it's not neat. So I'm just going to say that. It's, it's, it's not neat. It's not clean. Um, these are children. Um, and sometimes the levels go up, sometimes the levels go down. And as we work through the class size piece, um, that's an important thing to understand because, um, you know, we'll take last year at Southern Elementary School. For years, we had three classrooms in each grade level, and we had five kindergarten classrooms last year, and we needed five kindergarten. So we started out in the budget with three, and then we had, had to add two more. So again, as we're working with children, it's, it's, it's not a business. It's not always neat. It's not always clean. Um, but we do work through it, and that's why we start looking at this. We've started looking at this before uh, the holiday break, and we continue to look at um, the elementary class sizes because it is critical. So as you look over the years, 23-24, um, we are recommending um, some reductions. Um, these numbers for 23-24 are with the reductions already included. So they're very similar class size numbers um, to what we've had in the past in some areas a little little lower than what we had. And the other thing as we get to the next um, screen that I want to point out again, we're assuming 20 kindergarten students in each class and that they're full classes. So that means we're pushing up the numbers of, of students. That's not necessarily and probably is not going to be the case, uh, that we'd have 20 in every kindergarten class. And if we have to, more kindergartners, we have a plan for that too. Mrs. Green. Yes. I also note that those numbers are based on classroom teachers, not including the art, music, learning support, the other specialists within the class, in the schools. Thank you, Dr. Ruppert, for pointing that out. I forgot that point, too. So um, we do have uh, learning support teachers and special education teachers that um, push into the classroom and provide additional assistance. They are not included in these numbers. These are strictly classroom teacher numbers. So elementary class size, we're recommending a reduction of two classroom teachers. So when we say reduction, that's removing it from the budget, and it would th be through attrition or retirements, not existing staff. Um, we are also recommending that our Digital Academy teacher return to the classroom due to our low numbers in Digital Academy. And um, when we get through this slide, I'll have Dr. Ruppert talk about um, what we're going to do with Digital Academy. Uh, we are recommending that we have two teaching positions not filled at this time and held for enrollment purposes. And the reason that is Shrewsbury, we have budgeted three kindergarten positions, but there are often times that we need four. Southern Elementary School, we've budgeted four kindergarten positions, but we needed five this year. So again, we are ready if we get more kindergarten kiddos than what we've estimated um, to put a teacher in those classrooms. So um, really, as we're looking at these reductions, we're ready for both the kindergarten piece, but also, let's say we have 13 second graders move into Southern Elementary and it puts the class sizes up in second grade. We're, we're ready for that too. So that's why we want to hold these two enrollment positions because you know we want to make sure, um, especially from that kindergarten <clears throat> standpoint, that we're where we need to be. So you want to talk about Digital Academy? Thank you, Mrs. Green. Uh, regarding the Digital Academy, as Mrs. Green indicated that the Digital Academy teacher will be returning back to the classroom. Uh, the reason being is the students that, when you look COVID, we had many students that were in our Digital Learning Academy. And then moving through successive years, those numbers have decreased to the point where I believe we're right under uh, double digits for students at the elementary for next year. So what we have in plan is the students will continue with the Lincoln Learning uh, program, which is what uh, the students are accustomed to. And they will be supported by the elementary teachers. Uh, the elementary principals are working with uh, the teachers to determine who would be the teachers of record that would be working with those students. Um, we, we chose that as an option because you know we're familiar with, with the Lincoln Learning. Uh, the other option is if we have uh, parents that are maybe not interested in that, we also have the ability to work through the Lincoln Intermediate Unit who has a program called Lincoln Edge. Um, this is also a program that, you know, we're looking at communicating with uh, the parents that are currently in cyber, that the district is paying for them, and having a communication and offering that 
as an option because it is a huge cost savings by if they don't want to come back to our digital academy through Lincoln Learning, we can utilize uh, the, this Lincoln Edge through our Lincoln Intermediate Unit, which is an online program also, uh, provides a lot of the similar resources, uh, but in the, in the long run, it will provide a cost savings to the district. So those conversations, as Mr. Carrington was talking to earlier, are ongoing and will continue ongoing because, you know, our hopes is to bring all of our students back to our district. And by using one of those options um, for digital learning, uh, they would also have the ability to, to maybe take part in some of our classrooms here at the district um, and maybe transition either back full or, or part time to some of the things that are offered in the district. So it's that I'm um, working with the, with the uh, residents and the parents and, and families in our district. So now we'll turn to middle and high school. Um, we are uh, recommending a reduction of the instructional specialist position at Southern Middle School. So that is one position um, that we are not um, asking to fill at this point in time. And really, I'm going to turn it over again to Dr. Repper, but really um, we believe very strongly in the team philosophy that he'll talk about. And so we want to keep that intact. So we prefer to, to keep that the way it is and reduce this particular position. So I'll turn it over to so in my former profession as middle school principal, the one thing that you know, I have said, if I have not said it before, I'll say it again, thank you uh, because of your due diligence and with, with the budget process, the middle school is able to restore teams as we we're coming out of COVID. And the, the team process and the team philosophy really provides four schools within a school. So when you have three elementary schools coming into one middle school and those students at the elementary school in sixth grade where they're in those small pods, they know the teachers know those students, that's the same philosophy of the teams at the middle school level. And by having two teams in the seventh grade, two in the eighth grade, um, five teachers per team, those teachers know those students on those teams. So as you hear about you know, the, the mental health concerns, behavioral issues, uh, challenges that their students are dealing with, those teachers know those students. Those five teachers on each team clearly have an understanding as what those students' needs are academically. They're meeting every day during team meetings. They're having department meetings, but during those team meetings, I was in one today at the middle school and they were specifically talking about what they can do to make the middle school or their team better. And I think that those are, when you take a look at the, the position and the, the philosophy with the teaming, you know, it's really continuing to support uh, the, the growth of the whole child at, at the, the middle school level, especially with all the adolescent challenges that they're, all, they're dealing with on a daily basis, still having that close-knit uh, family feel is uh, very important. And then as we look at the high school, you know, when you look at the reductions, there's just a reduction of the, uh, the, the full-time paraprofessional. But at the high school, there's a lot of singleton courses, courses that are unique. They only have one of, like the EMS, uh, the advanced placement courses, um, the higher level languages. You know, those courses we want to continue to offer our students, but when you do that, now you have a teacher that might have 10 students in a classroom, whereas in another classroom in a, in a world history, there might be 20, 25. Um, so to continue to offer our students those opportunities to take those classes, help prepare them for where they want to go or what they want to do, um, having that flexibility uh, in the high school scheduling with those specific classes, uh, we, we believe is uh, uh, of utmost importance as a you know, further their educational career. So one of the things we also look at is our staffing compared to peers. So this is all of our instructional staff compared um, to student enrollment. And so we are right at the average, which is where we generally sit. Um, so the average is 16.95 and we're at 17.01, 01, 17.01. So we are right at average. Um, that's a good spot for us to be. That's where we'd like to be. Um, but we continue to keep an eye on this to make sure we don't go too high, too low. Um, but it is something we keep uh, on our radar. If you notice the number is much smaller there than the 20 that you saw previously, and it's just going back to 
Sue's comment that this number incorporates all professional staff, so you're going to have a, a lower student ratio. So one of the other additions to the budget, um, we did include allocation increases due to inflation for our buildings and areas. Um, for those that were on the board during the Great Recession, um, this is an area we, we cut and cut and cut to the point that we had very little ability to buy things in buildings and areas. Um, we probably, we didn't probably, we cut too deep um, to the point you know, for Randy, vacuums were falling apart, and we, we just, we had issues. Um, we do not think that is a good thing to do. Um, we can learn from that mistake during the Great Recession. Um, and with inflation as high as it is, even with a 5% or approximately $100,000, we're not keeping, we're not keeping up. Um, so a couple examples, our audit example, which is, um, we did a request for proposal. Back in the day, we would get four, possibly five proposals. We only got two. Um, one went up 16%. Um, that is our current auditors. And the other one went up another $10,000. So um, it, we are getting less responses from bidders and vendors, uh, which I think everyone is because they have a lot of business. Um, and the prices are going up. So uh, we do think that allocation increase is, is critical. Um, athletic transportation um, and officials, uh, the entire amount for um, athletics, the, their allocation increase was needed to cover transportation and officials. So it took the, the entire amount for those two increases. Um, Another thing that's included in the budget um, is an allocation for United bocce ball or unified bocce ball. So we have Special Olympics um, track and field, um, and we are also recommending that we do unified bocce ball. Um, it is a thirty-eight hundred dollar um, increase. It is not a lot, but it is the next sport that we would need to add if we want to continue adding um, sports. And remember, those teams have um, both. Um, athletes that are not on the varsity team or the JV team and those that are special needs. So um, it is unified, but all, they're all unified teams. Um, and if you've not had a chance to see one of their meets, um, it is a great time. It's wonderful. We all go out and, and volunteer and um, very moving. Uh, another area in the budget, we have a decline in the PEASERS rate for the first time in many, many, many years. Um, the rate is down from 35.26% to 34%, um, approximately $341,000, um, but it's probably short-lived. So it's estimated for the next seven years um, to go up next year to 34.73% um, and ending seven years after that at 38.35%. So the one thing I want to make sure, caution everyone on, we have budgeted at the 34%, which is the rate. Um, we did get a letter from one of our um, representatives, uh, came to Dr. Bryson basically saying, well, you know the rate's going to go back up, so make sure you're prepared for that. But the one thing I want to explain that's very difficult about the budgeting process is there's two ways to prepare for that. We either leave the rate as it is and in the budget, which means that money will flow into surplus, or we take it out and take the savings, and then it won't flow into surplus. So those are our two options. So I mean, the one thing I think that's difficult is whether it's health insurance or PEASERS, we can plan for it. But planning for it means that we're keeping the money in the budget, and then it's going to flow into surplus. So it's a balancing act. I guess I want to make sure everyone understands we do know that that rate's going to go up again next year. Um, and that 0.73% is 200000 of additional expense. We get 50% from the state, so $100,000 net to the district. Um, but to leave it in the budget, that means we're over budgeting. So it is, it is an extreme balancing act as we walk through things. So I just wanted to point that out because, you know, when we get letters like that, we read them, we, we try to digest them, but it is a difficult, difficult thing to, to work through. Other budget changes or decisions, we do not have included a dedicated safety and security coordinator. That has been a discussion over the last year. That is not in this budget. 
Um, we have reduced contingency down to $300,000, as we talked about earlier, which is what, where we typically have it. Um, we did include the firefighter tax credit program. It was not budgeted in 2022-23, so we had to add $50,000 for that. Um, and then we did talk a little bit about our positive reflection of changes in special education. Um, the one thing, I'm going to move on to the next slide. If you look at this slide, this shows special education. Um, the red line is placements, and you see how it kind of goes up very steeply and then um, not so steeply. Um, we've been working very hard in this area, um, both to bring back our students, because whenever we can bring back our students, uh, we want to bring them back to the district, but also to contain costs. So special education costs in the budget are up 2.26% for next year. Um, we are proud of that. While that's still an increase, um, to, a lot of times keeping special education costs uh, less than 10% is, is an achievement. So um, we, we will continue to work through this. And like I said earlier, we're continuing to look at other programs and ways that we can, can manage that. Can I add Absolutely. to that a little bit? I want to give kind of a real world example there. Um, so in, uh, I'll, actually, I'll give two real world examples. One would be new program at the elementary school to uh, incorporate our artistic support students here with us which we think is a huge benefit. Um, but that's probably a savings to twenty to $30,000 per child. So quickly, within bringing two classrooms to the district, you could view it as a potential two, $300,000 savings. However, they were brand new students as well. So it's not really a savings, but it would be if you consider it that we were going to put them all in an outside placement. Um, another example would be when we brought back a therapeutic emotional support classroom. We estimated within uh, a year or two there was approximately a $400,000 savings. Again, these are all things we're doing to look at not only supporting our students here within the district, but also making sure we're physically responsible because those are funds that can be utilized then throughout the rest of the district. Um, and that really was a similar process we used with uh, opening our own cyber charter, if you will, not charter, but cyber within the district and how to offer similar programming uh, for um, a much more physically responsible manner, uh, but also offer our, our graduation, our programming uh, through athletics, etc. So I just, I think it's important to, uh, for all to recognize it's not just a reduction of staff or increase of taxes. There are a lot of different moving pieces and parts um, and it's not just one year but over, um, over a long period of time that we've been working on this. And I did want to make a correction. I said it was 2.26%. It's 2.52%. So I didn't look at my notes and said the wrong number. So it's about 2.5% increase for special ed. So the other thing we want to make sure um, we have done everybody's radar as we go through the budget are we will begin contract negotiations for our professional staff very soon. Um, so our four-year contract uh, with professional staff ends on June 30, 2024. Uh, we want to make sure that we're in a position to remain competitive in our current labor market. So we've talked quite a bit about um, the, the reduction in number of folks going into education and staying in education. So we think it is, is important um, to put that out there. We want to make sure we're competitive for salaries, benefits, um, the environment we provide here, and also resources available to our, our professional staff um, working in the district. And as we work through, again, procurement, um, you know, as we bring things to the board, um, we're shocked, as I'm sure you are, on some of the price increases we're seeing. But we want to make sure that everyone understands we will continue to work, and we have um, in the past, and we'll always make sure um, that our pricing on goods and services is the lowest possible from responsible vendors. There's different ways to do that. But there are most times where we're not required to go out to bid or do a request for for proposal but we do it we still do that because like for audit you can just continue with your same auditor and negotiate a price but we do not do that we actually um, do that request for proposal to make sure we're getting that competitive pricing 
Um, we are experiencing a in decline in responses. Um, so you'll see Thursday night, if you review the agenda, that we are rejecting two bids. I've never had this happen, and we have two now. Um, we didn't get the one bid, and the other bid wasn't sealed, and then someone protested. So um, we are experiencing more of those types of things than I've ever seen. Um, it's, it's very unusual. Uh, the other thing we're hearing from vendors is um, the inability or unwillingness to hold prices. Mm -hmm. So when we get price quotes, um, it's becoming more difficult to get it, hold it, and get it on the board agenda. Um, so as we work through that, we will report to you. But um, we are having vendors say, I will not hold that until after your board meeting. So you know, as we work through things, we're going to have to continue um, to make you aware of that, too. Um, it, it is a different environment than what we've seen in the past. Just a question on that. Is it possible to give you authorization to take the low bidder with us? Yeah, as we work through it, I think that's one of the things that um, we may consider is is to look at um, parameters and then and then move forward with some kind of authorization. But um, I want to get a couple more examples on our belt before you know we come and ask for that. But it is something um, that we're seeing that we've really not seen in the past. But now that you're saying that, um, Jim, you know, the one thing on these two rejected bids, I can work with Randy. Um, we may want to consider revising, and we could do it tomorrow, re revising Thursday night's board agenda to allow us to do that. Because otherwise, we're, gonna, we're not going to make it back in for April. We don't have enough time to advertise and get back in for April. So I don't think we're going to be able to award till May. So I'll take a look at that. And that's a concern we have because now we're losing all these months because we're not going to be able to, to bring it back in. So let me take a look at that. Thank you for that, that suggestion. So as you know, we've been working through the um, Easter's plan, so elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds for, for quite a while. We, um, we've been allocated $4.2 million. Uh, we'll go through a detailed presentation Thursday night of uh, the revisions to that plan. So I think we've, we've put a great plan together, but um, things haven't come in exactly how we thought, which we knew that was going to happen. So some programs maybe didn't start quite as soon or cost as much as we thought. Um, in almost <clears throat> all cases, we spent less money than we thought. Um, and with federal funding, it's a little different the budget than the budget. When in the budget, if you spend less money, it rolls into fund balance and everybody's happy. Um, with federal funding, we need to spend all the money. Um, so we're going to come back. Um, with revisions, we've spent about spent or encumbered about 2.9 million dollars so far. Um, so we have that remaining amount. And then the important thing for for this budget and why it's included in this presentation is the rest of the funds have to be um, budgeted or encumbered in the 23-24 budget because they must be spent by June 30th of June 30th. They must be spent by September 30th of 2024. We would like to spend them by June 30th, so we make sure that everything is signed, sealed, and delivered. And um, the way we uh, want it, so we don't want to take any chance of losing any of those funds. So we want to make sure it's done by that June 30th time frame. So we've also talked about our long-term capital plan. So we're very <coughs> fortunate that our, our bill buildings are so beautiful and sustainable. Um, we've not, like other districts have had to do, we've not had to abandon any buildings because um, they got to the point that they were not able to be renovated. Uh, so um, we do think it's important to make sure um, that we keep those buildings up. Uh, we began that long-term facility planning in September 2018, um, and we've planned for all of our buildings from the start. So um, one methodology is to do one building at a time um, and not look at the whole plan. We've not done that because what we want to make sure of is when we get to the end that we still have funds available and that we're not spending too much at the forefront that we don't have money um, for that last project. So that's why we've kind of looked at it in, in uh, total. Uh, so, again, you've seen this a lot before. Um, right now, um, our, our most recent update on our long-term plan is 2.61 mils. Uh, original was 2.79, so we're down from that. Um, but debt's reoccurring, which is why we need to get it built into the budget. 
So we have 0.72 mills already in place. Um, we're recommending the 0.24 mills for 23-24. Um, we're also working with um, our financial advisors right now to um, look at the balance of the cash on hand versus debt offerings. Um, having a healthy cash balance um, equals better bond ratings and lower rates. So when, as Trevor talked about, we met with Moody's on um, a couple days ago. I can't remember what day now, but we met with Moody's to go through our bond rating. And, um, you know, they really look at that healthy cash balance and reserves as a critical piece. Um, that's not everything, but um, it is, is important for your bond rating um, and getting lower rates. Um, our rating will come out next week. We'll let you know once we have that. Um, it sounds like things are pretty good. Um, and then cash also helps to smooth in our financing um, so that we don't have peaks and valleys. Uh, and as we've been looking through this, um, it may result in one less issue at the end of the project. So we have our $10 million um, bond issue. Uh, so we've been working through the due diligence and, and rating calls for that um, to be issued in uh, spring of 2023. So that's um, slated to close um, in April. Um, it's necessary for the high school project, so that'll get us to about $65 million. So we're working with PFM now, um, our financial advisors, to determine the remaining funds for the high school and the sewer project. Do we want to issue another bond issue, or do we want to use some of our reserves? So there's pros and cons to both. Um, so we've started those discussions. I don't have an answer to that right now, um, so we're still working through it. Um, but one thing we may do is <coughs> recommend some use of... Um, existing cash instead of another bond issue. Um, but what is part of the decision making process is the interest rates on earnings right now versus borrowing. So remember on a bond issue, if we earn interest, um, we are able to keep that interest and use it for part of the project as long as we spend the funds. There's some other pieces, but the long and short of it is as long as you spend the funds within three years, um, you don't have arbitrage issues and, and you're okay. So we could borrow at this rate and be earning this rate, which is kind of what's happening now, um, and we get to keep the difference. And so um, that's what we're working through right now on whether or not we would want to use cash reserves or do another bond issue. Um, so it's not as simple as we don't, you know, you don't want to do debt. Um, there's, there's part of the interest rate earnings piece of it also. So we're working through that right now. So our overall expenditures increased 2.8 million. Um, Trevor talked about the uh, major cost drivers of $1.6 million. Um, we also have federal funds for one-time purchases of about a million dollars in there. Um, so basically, as we talked about the ESER plan, um, we need to spend down that money. And remember, we want to spend down that money in areas that are not reoccurring so that um, we don't fall off what's called the budget cliff next year um, when that federal funding goes away. And so we have in this budget about a million dollars of additional professional development, science equipment and programming, custodial equipment, um, a phase in, the phase-in piece of the Chromebooks. Uh, so, you know, when you look at the major cost drivers and the federal funds, that adds up, up to about $2.6 million. Our increase is only $2.8 million. So I just wanted to point that out because if you're looking at overall budget to budget, you're going to see... A, Part of it, the increase is this federal funds piece. All right. So Sue shared a lot about expenditures and other pieces of the budget. So I will take us to the other half, um, the revenue side of things. So um, there is about a 2% increase um, prior to the tax increase in our local revenues. That consists of an increase in our real estate tax assessment. So that went up about $300,000. That's net of the new tax credit program, which was $50,000. So we have seen some, some modest assessment growth. Um, unfortunately, we haven't received any new edits this spring from the county. Um, hopefully, they're not back to their old ways of being a little bit delayed, but uh, we're hoping to receive that soon, so we'll get a better idea of how our assessment is looking. But um, we do know we have growth in the district, um, just not as rapidly, probably, as it was two or three years ago. Earned income tax, um, that's about a 4% increase. So we've seen growth in that area as well. Um, that's pretty steady over the past several years. Um, the big highlight is interest earnings, and that's very popular in the news. Um, interest rates continue to tick up, and we benefit every time they increase. 
Um, we ladder our investments out, so we try to take advantage of the highest rate possible for the longest period of time within our board policy. Um, some decreases would be interim taxes, so that's just those, um, those new builds or assessment changes we get from the county. And then a um, decrease in delinquent earned income tax of about $125,000, or 36%. So while that does sound like a very large number, that's a result of a um, diligent effort by York Adams Tax Bureau to really go after those, um, not just for us, but for all of their um, municipalities of individuals that had very long overdue earned income taxes. Um, that one's kind of a roller coaster because it, it's really just, it, there's a lot of peaks and valleys with that one. Um, but they did a very good job really collecting some of the older taxes that um, needed to be remitted to the districts. And in light of the um, bank issues that are going on right now, it is important for us to note for interest earnings, um, our investments must be one year or less. They are all in um, highly secure principal and interest guaranteed um, investments. So we do not do anything risky, nor can we or would we want to. Um, but they're all one year or less, so we uh, really don't have risk there. So um, the other third of our revenue pie would be um, the state <coughs> revenue. So we have about a 4% increase in our state revenue. Um, some of the big increases are the increase in basic ed funding and special education funding. So we have a $474,000 increase to our uh, BEF or basic ed. And that would be the 2023 funding plus about a 1.24% increase. And then special ed funding is $200,000. Um, or the what we're receiving this year plus a 2.3 percent increase and those increases represent the increases that we received over the last five years with the exception of last year which had a very big increase and kind of skewed the data a little bit um, some decreases would be transportation so our transportation subsidy actually went down um, it was up a little higher just based on some of the funding formulas that came out of the pandemic um, PEASERS, this is a, an interesting one that is that it is a decline. Normally you see our PEASERS funding going up. Mm -hmm. That's a result of the 34% um, PEASERS rate. So we were paying a lot more in PEASERS prior. We are paying less now. So while it's good news on the revenue side, you do get that the kind of half part of it. Um, the rate decline was 34.73 to 34%. Actually and then estimated to go back up uh, more and more, as Sue talked about. So one thing that's uh, not up there, but it's really worth noting, so I believe it was a few weeks ago, the governor's budget, um, he released his budget, and within that, there were some sizable increases to uh, public education in Pennsylvania, and also the inclusion of some grant programs, like the safety and security grants, things like that. It's helpful to know that those are just um, his budget and his plan. The last time uh, we had a new governor it was about eight years ago and it took about 10 months for the budget to pass after the fiscal year ended. So it was, um, I believe it was March that the budget uh, was officially approved. So um, there's a long period of time between when the governor presents a budget to when it is approved and it um, isn't not always what he presents. So while it's wonderful to know that he's looking to get increases, um, it's very early in the game to understand what, if any, increases will come our way. Not a negotiating to come. Yeah, and while we're hoping for a June or July budget, <clears throat> again, I don't know if we want to live through the March budget. Uh, get, that's terrible. But um, we just want to make sure that everybody understands that, and we don't want to put too much state funding in here that we may not see ever or quickly. Did you say it doesn't always turn out the way it was presented? Yeah. Some ever? <laughs> Just say it. Doesn't always There's ever. a lot of movement in the budget. Yeah. There are some hopefuls, though, especially with the school safety and security with his proposal when it came out, you know, as far as SRO officers and things like that. School infrastructure, when I was looking at that, I thought, well, you know, Will we be able to recoup some of that money that was spent? <coughs> Hopefully. Yep. Or or future, for future. our future projects, mm -hmm. also possible. Mm -hmm. 
so the final piece of our revenue pie would be um, federal programming and our federal revenues. Um, this has been a highlight for the past few years, but prior to that, it was a very boring piece of our budget. Um, we have a 9.6% increase, or about $180,000. Um, that's all ESSER funding. Um, the ESSER funding ends with this budget for practical purposes. We have until September 30th, 2024 um, to spend out our grant, but we really do not want to get to that point because that gets a little scary and we don't want to be waiting until the last minute to spend our final dollars. Um, reoccurring uses of funds must be phased in um, for 2024-2025. So that gives us this one more year, pretty much this upcoming year, to phase in those programs or understand what our plan is with them. Um, well, that's an up and, a, and an increase. We do have some decreases. Title I is down about $50,000 for 22-23, and Title II is down $12,000. Um, so Title I we use for uh, reading program and reading programming, uh, and Friendship is our Title I school. And Title II, um, that's not really a big grant. And then Title IV is not on there. It, that's very small in comparison to all of this, and that's pretty level funded. Um, and then at the bottom, about less than one half of our one half of a percent <coughs> of our federal funding is not ESSER. So it's it's a tiny little number in comparison to the budget. It's a huge number in like the like actual dollar amounts. I think it's about four hundred thousand. So that's a talk small for thousand dollars it's just not millions compared to our s or funding is the um, decrease with title one does that have to do with just a lower enrollment like is there a correlation between those two things title one is based on enrollment um, census data so mm -hmm. our free and reduced lunch population but it's also really our population based on the entire state's movement so while we may have say gone up if the rest of the state went mm -hmm. up, it's really how did we go up in comparison to that. Um, and then enrollment does play a factor. Yeah, the bigger of the pieces, I would think, in the case of Title I, is probably your free and reduced lunch or poverty measures. So um, for our over, overall revenue, uh, there was an increase of about 2.9%. This 2.9% includes $1.7 million of non-reoccurring federal funding. Um, so really just to call the numbers out, 65% of our revenues are local revenues. That's pretty standard uh, for us. Somewhere in the 30s, 32% their state revenue, and then 3% is our federal revenue. Um, this is probably the last budget you're going to see that 3% number up there for federal revenue. Uh, it will drop down to anywhere between 2 and 1% and just based on the, the makeup of the budget. And that's what it was prior <clears throat> prior to the pandemic and ESSER funding. All right, so I'll turn it back over to Sue. So as we look at um, our history of tax increases um, on the chart, we just um, compared uh, the actual tax increase to the Act 1 index and in inflation. Um, so as you can see, it um, kind of shows you where we are in those two, um, those two measures. Uh, so in the, on this chart, uh, we had five years of no tax increases, and um, almost every year we're, we were below the index um, and at or below inflation, depending on what the index was. So the history of our tax increase over the last 10 years, we've averaged about 1.5% um, versus the average for Act 1 has been about 3%. Um, the average for inflation has been about 2.5% over the last five years. Um, we've averaged 1.03%. Um, the average of Act 1 has been 34 and average inflation has been 3.6%. So we always uh, review our tax rate comparison. Um, so uh, in green is um, what we're proposing. Um, so that will put us... Um, and again, I always like to say this, we do not put the budget together um, and, and with the idea that we want to be the lowest or we want to compare to other um, districts, but we do it after the fact. So um, even with this rate, we uh, would be lower than um, our other local districts, um, even if they don't have a tax increase. Um, and what that means for our, um, our taxpayers is a median home 
in Southern York County School District is $181,560. Um, so we get that number each year from the county. We have not gotten it yet for this year, so that's last year's numbers, but we does not usually change too much. Uh, we'll get that at the beginning of May uh, for this year. Um, so that means $88.96 cents uh, additional tax um, based upon that median house. Uh, so you'll see in the paper sometimes they use $100,000. We believe it's important to use median. So if you think median is middle, that means that half of the taxpayers will pay less in additional tax than that and half um, residential taxpayers will pay more. So we saw this slide at the beginning of the presentation, uh, but we wanted to put it in again um, to review um, where our revenues and expenditures are. So we have about a $2.5 million deficit. Um, we use fund balance to balance um, of $1.5 million. Um, then we have the safety and security projects um, that were approved um, in February of $185,000 use of fund balance. Leaves a deficit without a tax increase of the $822,000, um, which equates to a 2.4% tax increase. Um, and then we always like to show fund balance. Our fund balance at the end of last year was $17.2 million in total. Um, we're projecting based upon um, this year's budget that we will add $1.3 million to that. Um, we reduce it by those uses of fund balance on the previous screen, which would leave us estimated fund balance of $16.8 million. Um, we always have unassigned a 5%, and then you see the assigned fund balance. So that is slightly down um, from the prior year uh, to $13.5 million, um, and that's based upon the uses, the transfer to the Capital Reserve Fund, and some of the other uses um, for security projects. And, and whatnot, so um, comparable but down as far as the assigned fund balance piece. So our budget next steps, um, as we talked about at the beginning, but our review at the April board meeting, um, you will we'll do another budget presentation, much shorter budget presentation, mm -hmm. and approve. Um, then we're asking for approval of a proposed 2023-24 budget. Again, we talked about what um, that would look like. Uh, the tax rate is not approved at that time. It's only set once in May. But again, um, the, the budget document would include that because we have to balance the budget. Um, so we're asking if there's questions or information that we have those before April. We really like to stay to this timeline. Um, and what that does is make sure that there's consistency for our taxpayers. Um, we don't want our tax bills and, and due dates to jump around. Um, they always come out on July 1st. That does a couple things. Again, important thing from a taxpayer standpoint is we don't want to be changing due dates because then um, you know, we change one year and change back um, and people won't know when the, the tax bills are due. The second thing that it does, especially in this interest rate environment, is we get the tax bills in, we get the, the taxes um, back to us um, so that we can invest them and we make more interest, which helps to keep the tax rate down. And so I think it is really important to, to follow that timeline. Again, in the 20-some years that I've done this, very few budgets are passed. Um, by the state at a point that we could approve um, in June anyway, so I don't think there's a, a benefit to our taxpayers to do that. Um, and then May would be the final approval of the budget, and at that point is when the tax rate is set and the homestead farmstead information is determined um, for residential and, and farmstead properties. Any questions? All right. Open it up for questions. <laughs> I have one question, um, and I probably missed it, so just connect the dots for me. Sure. The debt services, what's included in the debt services? So debt service will be the money put aside for our, to pay our bonds. So um, we issue debt uh, in the district for capital projects. So any, so it would be mostly building renovations, but then you have like the sewer project that um, we're also working on. Uh, those types of things, but that's the only things we issue debt for here. So it will be um, the money that we're putting back, the millage we're putting back, um, so that we plan for that long-term capital plan and that we have it in place. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And then can you tell me again, how does the sewer cost fit into this? Is this 
So the sewer project was part of um, what was called, we did greatest needs projects um, several years ago. That was part of the, the long-term capital plan. So when as we work with our financial advisors, um, there were, um, we did some chillers originally, like as we, let me back up. So we did a fe feasibility study, and the one thing we learned were there were several projects uh, that needed to be done out front of the major building renovations. Um, so we had some windows at the middle school. I think we had some windows at Southern Elementary. We had some chillers in some buildings. Um, the sewer was part of that. And then, but that was all part of our big capital plan mm -hmm. um, in round numbers of about $130 million. And so um, the sewer was part of that. So we've been working through that as part of it. So um, that money to pay for that would either come from bond funds mm -hmm. or from what we've reserved in fund balance. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Other questions? I have a couple. Okay. <laughs> uh, can I take you all the way back to the charter school cost graph that was got fairly early in the presentation? <clears throat> Almost there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that uh, $1,053 for uh, the county, does that include York City? I believe so. Okay. I'd be interested in knowing if you took York City out of the picture, what does it look like? Because if we're using that as a comparison, York City a lot of times tends to skew those kind of numbers. Right. Yeah, so we can run that without, without that. So we have, um, we, this is part of Forecast 5, which we use, but we can pull out, we can pull out individual data and then rerun okay. it without that. Yep. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does because the county would include all school districts yeah. in it. Yeah. They are part of our county. Yeah. Um, and then if we go forward now to the staffing compared to peers that bar chart with the red bars going to the right for the different school district that one yeah mm -hmm. I look at that and I say that I can't say that that number there is uh, really reflective of ac ac academic performance, students per teacher. You know, some of the higher performing districts in, in the county uh, have a, a lot more students per, te per teacher than some of the lower performing ones, which is just an observation, but I, I'm not sure what the takeaway from that is intended to be, or is it just informational and we should ponder it. I think with like with any data there you're you're right there's there's those that we can tend to compare ourselves to that are a little on the lower end of the chart um, there are you're right so we have some higher performing so I think it's just another piece of data to say okay are we way are we way out of line or are we are we in the in the mix so I think I think that for us that's what it is just kind of a a smell test to make sure we're not way out of whack in one direction or another. Yeah, well, I guess my takeaway from it is I'm not sure that in and of itself the number of uh, teachers per student, if we slipped up higher in that, that I would be convinced that that was necessarily a bad thing. And mm -hmm. That we probably have some room to go. That the reason our academic performance is what it is isn't so much a function of how many <coughs> students per teacher we have, mm -hmm. for whatever that's worth. Uh, then going ahead about five slides to the special education placement cost. Yeah. Um, this is the engineer talking now. But when I see a graph that says, Special ed, special ed total cost versus placements. Down there on the x-axis, I expect to see 
numbers, like number of placements. And I'm not sure, I see dollar signs on the left side, so I kind of understand what that is. That's how much we spent. But what's... That's also dollar, it's, it should be placement costs. Placement, oh, so that's... <laughs> Both costs. So the, the number on the left is total special total. education costs. The number on the right, I'm very bad at my axes, so forgive me. Yeah, I know, um, I know from some the right of the things number. you did, your engineering skills. <laughs> <laughs> the, <clears throat> the number on the right um, represents our total placement costs. Okay. So, and included in total placement costs, just to uh, go slightly deeper, um, that would be any placements through the Lincoln Intermediate Unit, um, as well as there are 560 placements, so any outside um, tuition, which would be um, other learning. LEAs um, or charter schools. So part of that uptick is actually our charter school um, expenditure for special education students. Okay, so um, if I subtract the number on the right from the number on the left, that would say what we spend on our kids internally? Is that what I mean? Is that? Okay. Right, and as, as Mr. Carrington said, the one, one of the pieces that's the uptick there on the placement piece is um, for next year, our special ed cyber um, number is going up by about $100,000. Okay. Um, state revenue, why, why is our transportation subsidy going down? So there's a couple different components for transportation subsidy. Um, one of those is your market value aid ratio. So um, when your market value aid ratio changes uh, and you become less poor as a uh, uh, compared to the rest of the state, um, then your subsidy goes down. Okay. And then the second piece, which is probably the bigger of the two pieces in this, is during um, COVID there were hold harmless pieces because remember we had, they did not count the number of students you were transporting. They assumed what you had from the last year because um, we had hybrid schedules, we had a lot of kids not riding buses, we had, you know, days that you didn't go to school, all those kinds of things. So um, we were in a holding period of hold harmless. Um, we're out of that now. And so we are out of that as of last year, but our subsidy is a year in arrears. And so our subsidy for next year is from last year. And so um, that's kind of where we are. So are, <coughs> are there more kids riding now? There are. I mean, it seems like um, we're getting back, excuse me, to normal. Uh, I wouldn't know that exactly, but it seems like we're getting back to normal on the number of kiddos that, that are riding the bus. Um, but there's, there's a lot of factors involved with it, and, and some of it is how you relate to other places in the state. <coughs> yeah, just uh, somebody I'm pretty familiar with, uh, just a friend made the comment that there seems like an awful lot of kids being transported by their parents and that the buses don't appear to be full. He said, well. But, but and you're right, we want to get as many kids on buses as, as we can, but our subsidy is actually driven not by the number of students <coughs> that are physically on the bus, but the number of students are rostered on the bus. And so, um, so in other words, we want kids that are supposed to be on that bus. That's how it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we we want to provide transportation to any student that um, would like to have in transportation at any time because it's really the roster piece. But again, we want them to ride the bus, but mm -hmm. but it really is the roster piece. And certainly, secondary is less students riding than elementary oh, yeah. for sure. Right. And I think the challenge there is you roster them, then you realize who's really riding the bus. But tomorrow, they could get back on the bus. So if you extend those routes and increase right. numbers, you're setting yourself up for disaster. Well, the other thing I told him was, 
if it's if it's a bus later and it's going to elementary schools, a lot of times the kids' hands aren't above the seat. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, you they can't. You can't see us. <laughs> and you can't see the children. You know, so, okay. and, That's the way it is. And Dr. Bryson makes a good point. Some of our, our buses are less rostered, um, especially in the Cadoras area, because of the amount of time it takes to get the students oh, yeah. to school. So um, they may be, you know, rostered at 45 children um, because it already takes 45 minutes to an hour to get those children to school um, based on the, the bus route. So um, very complex um, and I always joke that we have to roster them for snow days when we're at school and it starts to snow because everybody gets on the bus then um, and so um, we need to make sure because sometimes we have a lot of kids on the bus of those days that it snows so we have to always be prepared for that day. That was my last one. Mike, did you give all your questions? Kelly? I'm good. Bobby? I'm good, thank you. Jim? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Everybody's good. So, real quick, uh, just a, a thank you to both Sue, Trevor. Um, you're both very well respected throughout the county. Maybe I didn't know that until I'm in my new position and have an opportunity to work with my colleagues um, and, and only to find out that my colleagues go to you, their business officials and they call you to find out what's really going on. Um, Trevor, you're not quite there yet with that reputation, but you're <laughs> So I want to thank both of you, specifically Sue, for just the leadership you not only provide Southern, but, but honestly across the county and state. So thank you. Thank you. So we will get the um, detailed budget books together, and we will send those out via PDF next week um, for you to review all those lines. Are you <laughs> going to do that on paper? We were going to do that in PDF via email. Yeah, that's P Yeah, that's yep. okay. <laughs> if that's, if that's okay. So we'll send those out. Fantastic. And um, then if you have any questions, please give us a holler. Okay. I'd just like to repeat Dr. Bryson's sentiment. And thanks. And thanks to everybody in your department that contributed to this and continues to contribute. Okay. It makes our job a lot easier than it might be. We will thank you. Uh, any other items of business? All right, then I'm going to declare the meeting adjourned.